My name is Anjana Nardine. I am a junior studying journalism at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a fall grad and an intern for the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Tonight's discussion will examine and connect two important topics, education and journalism. We want to say a special thank you to John Smalley and the Wisconsin State Journal for reserving this room with us tonight, excuse me, and to the EVU Foundation for supporting Simpson Street Free Press and for supporting youth journalism. Helping me facilitate tonight is my Simpson Street Free Press colleague, Layla Fletcher. Thank you, Angiana. My name is Layla Fletcher, and I'm a student at Madison West High School, and I'm also a teen editor at Simpson Street Free Press. Tonight's panelists are four accomplished journalists currently working in the Madison media market. Emily Hamer is a reporter for with the Wisconsin State Journal and recently took over the criminal justice beat for the newspaper. Jenny Peake is a digital news editor for Wisconsin Public Radio and an education reporter for Isthmus. Taylor Kilgore is the managing editor of Simpson Street Free Press and also a UW-Madison School of Journalism graduate. And Amanda Quintana is a general assignment reporter for the N News anchor for Wisconsin TV, News 3 Now, here in Madison. Our format tonight is pretty straightforward. All our questions will be asked by the students here and will be directed at one or two of the panelists. But of course, any of the panelists can uh, jump in on any of the questions. Before our high school students ask questions, we'll ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and take a minute or two to tell us how you got interested in journalism, where you went to school, and why you decided to pursue an education in journalism. We're gonna start with Taylor. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, like they mentioned, my name is Taylor Kilgore. I am the managing editor at Simpson Street Free Press. I uh, went into journalism in college, um, really because of my time at Simpson Street Free Press and the importance that I realized, uh, the importance of journalism and the importance of learning to write well. And I knew that it would take me far I did not know exactly what I wanted to do, uh, whether it was journalism or something else, but I knew that writing was going to be an important part of it. Um, and so, yeah, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Actually, it's my two-year anniversary <laughs> for graduating. I guess I could say maybe yesterday, I think it was, um, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, School of Journalism. So it's just been a great opportunity for me to go into that field. And uh, again, I really just, went that route by understanding the importance of writing through my time at Simpson Street Free Press. I actually started uh, in eighth grade at Simpson Street Free Press and now I'm 24 years old and still here. <laughs> so um, it really just shows the trajectory and the kind of grow your own pipeline that we have uh, when it comes to uh, being a student at Simpson Street Free Press and what you can really do and progress uh, as you grow in the program. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a reporter with the Wisconsin State Journal. I went to school at UW-Madison um, with, and I got a degrees in journalism and philosophy. Um, I, I've always liked writing, and when I was little in uh, elementary school, I would write all these stories and write like, little books about fantasy things or like being in the ballet or something um, but I was always kind of intimidated by having to write a story on a daily turnaround um, but I joined the Badger Herald when I went to college just sort of because I had some free time and I thought I needed an extracurricular activity and I ended up just really loving it there and sort of learning how to be a reporter and that's why I started pursuing this career um, and then I I also interned at the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism when I graduated which kind of started me on my professional path before I uh, got the job at the State Journal so and I started at the State Journal this past May and I'm I'm Jenny Peake. I uh, was first interested in journalism or pursuing a career in it when I was 12 years old. Um, I remember watching the news one evening. Um, it was it was actually right when 9-11 uh, when happened and I just remember watching it and 
understanding how important what I was learning about was and how the news was providing this avenue to the entire world to talk about something that was really important. And this was like just an incredibly monumental time in my life. But I was 12, so I was a little kid. But I just remember writing down quotes that like the president was saying and knowing they were important for some reason. And so as I continued through high school, you know, I worked at our school newspaper and went to UW-Madison and got a degree in journalism and worked for the Daily Cardinal and just also loved to write and knew that in some way, shape or form, I wanted to have a career writing and bringing information to people. And so also I'm like a diehard Madisonian and wanted to stay here. And so I've kind of since graduating tried to find a career and something I can do here in town and still give back to the community. And that's kind of how I found the Isthmus. And I freelanced, started, started freelancing with them in 2013 and started covering education with them. And then recently started working for Wisconsin Public Radio as a digital editor. And I'm kind of pursuing that avenue as well. And I'm just excited to see where it goes. Um, so my name's Amanda Quintana and I did not go to UW-Madison. Um, so I went to San Diego State. I don't really, I think I just kind of fell into journalism. I always liked writing. Um, and I went to this class where it was a media studies class. And the teacher the first day kind of started saying, this is not the class for you if you want to be on TV and be a reporter and be out there doing breaking news. And I thought, well, I think I could do that actually. So I dropped the class um, and I started um, paying attention to video. Um, and I think I just kind of realized that news has always been a part of my life. Um, you know, I, wake, I would wake up every morning and watch the news with my mom in the morning and I didn't really realize what an impact it had on you when you're a kid. You just think that's what you do every, thing, every day. You watch the news and you learn about things and you, even as a kid, go to school and you could talk about topics that, you know, as a kid, wh why do you know about that? Um, but topics that were important. So um, it just kind of happened. And now that I'm in it, I realized that I was meant to do it. You know, I, I didn't really think about it as I was becoming a journalism major, it just kind of happened and now it's meant to be. Thank you all so much. Um, our first question is gonna be asked by Ms. Josepha. My name is Josepha DaCosta and I'm a writer at Simpson Street Free Press and a student at Madison La Follette. My question is for Jenny and Amanda. This past summer, I interned at Midwest Family Broadcasting. That experience really opened my eyes to how much work goes on behind the scenes. Can you talk a little about working in broadcast journalism? In particular, I'm interested in all the different types of jobs that can be pursued if a young person decides to go in this field. Okay. Um, so you're right. There are a lot of different options in broadcast. Um, so I, I do a few different things that I can kind of explain. So I am a multimedia journalist, so that means you're out there on your own. You are doing the camera, you are doing the editing, you are doing the questions, you are meeting the people, you are calling the people, you are kind of doing all of that on your own. Sometimes I'm considered a reporter, which is, you know, you're, you're doing all of the questions and interviewing and stuff still, but I have a photographer with me. That's a little more helpful just timing wise, but if, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, so I kind of want to do it myself sometimes. <laughs> so, um, and then there are, I'm also a news anchor. So I, on those days, I don't go out and get the stories. I'm kind of presenting them during the newscast. So um, a bunch of different ways that you can get involved. Um, some of the photographers sometimes go out on their own without a reporter and they can put a story together on their own as well. So um, a couple different ways that you can be in it. And um, I think some days, it's kind of rare that I have more than three hours to put something together. So it is fast. 
Uh, it depends on when someone can be interviewed. So if they can be interviewed at 11 a.m., that is great for me. If they can't be interviewed until two o'clock, I've got an hour to put it together. So you kind of have to be thinking while you're asking them the questions, what part of this is gonna be in the story and kind of gotta be on your toes a little more when you're in broadcast. Yeah, I would definitely second that. At Wisconsin Public Radio, there's sort of two different trajectories. And so we have a news team and that consists of reporters that do something really similar to you where they have a 3 p.m. deadline and they're out to get a 45 second spot that is just the news of the day, it's breaking. And then they'll also write a digital component. But then there's the talk shows as well that decide they wanna talk about something, they book experts and they come up with the interview questions. And so we have talk show hosts and producers that do more of that each day, hour long program that has a little bit more flexibility in it. And then we have reporters that are kind of out there on their own reporting a story. And they all have editors to work with and um, both digital and on air. But we use a lot of Audition, which is an, a sound editing program. And um, the spots kind of range from shorter 45 second-ish things. But then we also do features, which are longer, around three minutes or so. And those fit into all things considered in morning edition, which NPR does as well. And so it's kind of neat because there's a lot of people at WPR doing a lot of different things. Everyone, most everyone has a journalism background, but there's a huge variety. And I'm, I'm still learning all of the different things people are doing. Thank you both so much. Next question is going to be Ashley. So this is a question for Emily. Um, my name is Yanni Taronka and I'm a student in Madison East High School. So recently, police in Minnesota found hidden cameras in hotel rooms occupied by kids, and those students go to Madison East High School. And after circulating through social media for several days, the story was first reported by Dylan Brogan at the Isthmus on December 13th, and was discovered and was covered by you um, in the Wisconsin State Journal on December 13th. Can you tell us what it's like to be a reporter to, and digging into stories such as this? And do you think in this case it's a good idea for the school district to withhold certain information from the press? Emily, do you mind repeating the question just very briefly, um, if you don't mind, for the rest of the audience, please? Okay. Uh, and then um, people who are asking questions, so I uh, did a story last week about um, uh, students finding hidden cameras in a hotel room in Minneapolis. They were Madison East High School students. And um, Yanni, you were just asking about uh, the process that it took to report that story. And if I think it is good or that the school that the school district should withhold some certain information from the press basically did i miss anything okay um so i think that story was actually pretty challenging to get a hold of um i had to call so many different people and they just would not give me any information at all i called the uh, I finally got a hold of the Minneapolis Police Department, and they wouldn't tell me that it that the devices were hidden cameras. They told me that um, the police found electronic devices in the hotel room, even though I knew all the media reporting that all of the media and Dylan's story was reporting that they were cameras. So I knew they were cameras, but we needed to confirm that and they wouldn't confirm it with me. And the school district also wouldn't confirm it with me. They wouldn't tell me what hotel it was at. They wouldn't say when it happened. Um, and so I, um, I also called the Madison Police Department and their uh, spokesperson was gone for the day because my editor told me about the story at like 4 p.m. when uh, Joel Despain, who's the spokesperson for Madison Police, he had already left for the day. And so it was, Joel was able to call me back, but he also didn't know for sure. He couldn't confirm that they were 
hidden cameras and so it was a lot of we cannot confirm or deny what happened in Minneapolis or when it happened or what exactly happened or who found the cameras um, and so I am the Sp spokesperson for the school district he I had a conversation with him and he gave me a little more information and I just kind of pressed him a little bit more and explained to him this information is already out there we just need to confirm it and let people know what happened and he was able to get back to me and give me some more information um, we also found Madison police told me that they uh, I think it was Cottage Grove conducted like a search warrant or they were involved in the investigation um, and I had another reporter help me sort of follow up with Co Cottage Grove to see why they were involved and he was able to talk to the Cottage Grove police chief and he let us know that they did a search warrant there and in order to um, I did a lot of searching through Madison East's website too and I was able to find their calendar and what specific event happened and I knew that the school district didn't want the particular club that it was named to protect the students so I kind of explained well I know this what this club is when this happened um, can you just give me a little more and they were able to give me more information I do think that it is important that they withheld some information from me though. Not all of the information, that was a little frustrating, um, but I think that it's important that they protect the students, that they also protect um, the, the person who is being accused of putting the cameras there because we don't know that that person did that for sure yet because that's going to come as a result of the police investigation so we we kind of know who they're looking at but we haven't printed that yet because we don't think that that would be fair to that person um, and can and I think it's important for us to not interfere with the police investigation I just wish they would tell us a little bit more information Um, my name is Kajada Ba, and I am also a student at Madison East High School. Um, my question is for Jenny. Um, your cover story published this summer in the Isthmus, Sounded Out, um, caused a lot of discussion about the consistently low reading scores that have been occurring in Madison. Um, you wrote about the science of reading and cited the work of Mark Seidenberg, a UW-Madison professor and cognitive neuroscientist. How? And why did you decide to pursue the story? And will you please summarize what parents and the public can learn by reading the cover story? Yeah, definitely. So I've been covering education at Isthmus for about two years. And we had a concerned citizen send an email to Isthmus a couple times. She'd written an op-ed that kind of pointed to the disparities in reading levels in the Madison School District. And I don't have those numbers directly in the top of my head, but just that uh, students of color are far and away below proficiency when it comes to reading levels, whereas their white peers are much higher. But in general, across the board, Wisconsin and Madison in comparison to other states in the nation have pretty low reading scores in general. And so we thought that that was pretty interesting. And in the constant kind of conversation with Madison's disparities and the achievement gap, it felt like maybe an integral piece of that story. And we had covered, I had done a different story about uh, students having teachers that look like them and what power that has in it. And so this was kind of another avenue and angle to get into this question of how can Madison as a city best serve its youth and make sure that they are set up to succeed in the future. And so once, <laughs> once we decided we were going to cover the science of reading, I discovered that it is very complicated and people have a lot of opinions about it. And I was, a, you know, it was a little bit unexpected to uncover something that had a lot of opinions. And so I started working 
on the story, talked to a lot of parents, the school district, uh, who was a little hesitant to talk to me and find data to give me. But from what I could tell is parents are, are outsourcing their reading curriculum. They're basically going to tutors if they can afford it because their kids aren't learning how to read and they're really concerned about it as they should be. And so I talked to a tutor um, who has been kind of tutoring the district in the area for about 20 years and looked at the kind of the science of reading stuff that she is showing where early on starting with phonics and a really specific stepped way to like learning letters and sounds and how those relate and then once you get those basics then you're ready to kind of move on to what we think of as comprehension and maybe the more fun parts of reading but without that basis it's like incredibly difficult to ever move on beyond that base and madison and wisconsin is kind of a holdout of this balanced literacy approach that uh, focuses a little bit more on guessing and comprehension and just that that can kind of maybe set kids up to fail, especially if they're already struggling. And so the conversation is continuing to go. I'm still covering it. The district is in the process of reviewing their reading curriculum for the first time in 10 years. And they have started having some meetings with parents to try to learn about their concerns and there's been calls from the community to have more opportunities to share those concerns and give their input on what they want the district to do. And come this summer, I think they're going to release what they're thinking they're adopting. I believe August is when that's gonna come out. And so it's a topic that's continually evolving and something that I plan to continue covering. But I think in general, what I'm hearing from parents and hearing from a lot of educators and advocates is that they just kind of want to seat at the table and want to make sure that the district is choosing a path that offers the best foot forward for students. Does that, is, okay, great. <laughs> so my question is for Amanda. Again, my name is Layla Fletcher. Uh, your recent feature story televised on News 3 Now also covered the topic of literacy in our city and our state. Uh, and like Miss Peek's story, your piece also caused a lot of discussion. You called this one of your favorite stories that, and one that you're most proud of. Can you please tell us how you decided to investigate the topic and maybe summarize what you learned about the science of reading debate? Yeah, so I think that my news director, who's like my boss, saw your story. And she was very concerned because she has a young student. I think her daughter is six or seven. And so she, you know, saw your story and then kind of started to notice at home when her daughter was reading, hey, what's this word? Just kind of trying to see how she had learned to figure it out. And we noticed that it, it really is either skip it, either guess it, look at the picture, try to figure it out. Um, and so we just decided to look into it further. Um, I think that similarly, I figured out this is a very controversial topic, which I didn't really think it was going to be because to me, it sounded like, okay, you should sound it out. That's how I learned to read. I just kind of figured that other kids were learning how to read that way. Um, so I learned that there are a lot of differing opinions in this. Um, and what I was really interested in he finding was somebody who was willing to talk about this, who, you know, their student is struggling and they don't have money for a tutor. Not everyone has money for a tutor, especially um, the woman that I ended up talking to, the mother, she had three kids that were all struggling. So it sets up this whole other issue of if you can't afford a tutor and if this school isn't teaching the student the way that they kind of need it to be taught, then what, what happens? You're just kind of left there and you know, what can you do? Um, so this mother ended up taking her kids out of that school, going to another school. It was still difficult. Uh, she found different tutors and ended up finding someone that was able to really teach them the phonics. Um, I think oftentimes what what i'm thinking of what is going to bring this story home for the viewer and for me that was seeing a mom who is in this situation and 
needed to figure out what to do. So that's kind of why I looked into it to kind of see the face of who this is affecting and the students that it was affecting. My name is Leilani McNeil, and this question is for Taylor. In 2018, you broke the story about an Office for Civil Rights investigation and a resolution agreement that called into question access for black and brown kids to honors and AP classes in the Madison schools. Since that time, there has been a lot of discussions and a lot of meetings. Have you followed the story of access to advanced learning opportunities in Madison? Thanks, Leilani. Uh, yeah, so this is a topic that was really close to my heart. Uh, I think that this is something that parents and families have been wanting or asking about for a long time. Um, I personally experienced during my time in the district uh, this kind of lack of opportunity for students of color uh, for advanced placement courses. And I think the disparity is super timely and important. And it's timely because um, it's been a long time coming. You know, when I started, it was my freshman year or even before that, my freshman year in high school in the district was 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. So, and this was an issue then and it's been an issue before that. Um, and so it was important because, um, you know, if, you, if students don't take AP courses, for example, they will be denied the opportunity to kind of skip that during their college career, meaning they need to pay for that course during their college career and it adds a lot of financial burden to them. Um, and so, yeah, so right now the resolution is uh, signed um, and which I reported um, was signed by Jennifer Cheatham and they are going through with the resolution. Uh, but I would say that I've heard that the process is a lot slower than uh, we would like it to be. And so I really just hope that things pick up with this progress um, because like I said, it's been a long time coming and um, it's super timely and important. And I think the, you know, it's important for young reporters um, like yourself, Leilani, and for concerned citizens to understand the facts and kind of just go from there on what they decide to do or understand about the process. Um, but again, reporting on it is super important uh, so that <laughs> Hello, my name is Sarah Yuseche. Um, I go to Madison College and I'm also the editor for our Spanish publication, La Prensa. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, so my question is for Emily. Um, this week you reported on a contentious issue regarding the Madison School District's purchase of a new building um, to house special education programs for students with disabilities. Uh, can you please walk our student journalists through the process of covering a story like this? Um, how did you as a reporter look at the different viewpoints about the building purchase and how did you report all of this to the public? Thanks so much. Um, I, I actually, uh, a big part of going to that meeting was all of the reporting of my colleague Logan, uh, who is the K-12 education reporter at the State Journal. So he kind of, he had a story, a couple stories that sort of laid out all of the background for me on the issue. And I was able to pull a lot from that because that was actually the first school board meeting that I've ever gone to. So I was kind of thrown into the thick of it. Um, I, it was a very long meeting. It was, it went from, I think like six to 10 p.m. Not the longest meeting I've been to, but, um, and the, they made the vote right on my deadline, which was really challenging. Um, but the, the story is basically that um, their, the school district, they decided to purchase um, a building to house some of the special education programs. Uh, I forget exactly what they're called, but they're these, inter they call them these intervention programs that are for students that need uh, 
um, yeah, just a lot of assistance, and there is a they have all these resources for them in, in these programs, but a lot of people were angry because they are segregated from the school, and so many people from the public were frustrated that these the school district they said the school district was essentially segregating students with special needs and disabilities and um, that's why the decision was so controversial and it ended up being a um, a four to three vote so it almost split the school board uh, but the reporting process for me was pretty straightforward I just I went to the meeting and I listened as people were talking and I um, you gotta type really fast to try to get the full quotes of people as they're discussing and make sure you get their names um, but it was kind of all sides discussed their opinions at the meeting so <laughs> um, this question again is for Jenny. Um, in August of 2019, you published a story in the Isthmus about Mike Hernandez who was leaving East High School and accepting a downtown administrative job. You quoted Mr. Hernandez saying that he questioned some past decisions made by Doyle building staff. As a student at Madison East, I know many of us were sorry to see Mr. Hernandez leave our school. In your story, you quoted Mr. Hernandez, saying he made the switch because he could, quote, help influence some practices citywide. In this story, and the story we asked you about earlier, you seem to know your beat. Is this because you grew up in East Madison? Does your knowledge of East Madison, of the East Madison community, help you know what to cover and, how, and help you investigate these stories that you cover? Yeah, I mean, I do think that any reporter who is committed to what they're doing can work their way into a community and get to know people and work really hard to make a connection and get good stories. I don't think you have to be born in a place to excel and do right as being a journalist. That being said, it maybe takes less work <laughs> in the long term. So I, I went to Madison East. I graduated in 2007, so I'm a pergolder. My little sister is a freshman in college, so she just graduated from East last year. So I've known Mike Hernandez since he was her principal at Sherman Middle School. And I have been able to see over time the changes that he was able to make at both Sherman and at East. And so when we found out First, like I did a profile on him a couple years ago in his second full year as principal, and we just knew that some of the things that he was putting into place were different than we had seen at East and different than we had seen at Sherman. And these two schools who have an incredibly diverse population of students from different neighborhoods of different socioeconomic statuses and different backgrounds, he has been able to put into place things that have made a lot of people succeed and feel comfortable and bring the community into the school, which is, I think, happening more across the city. But we really, I keep saying we, I mean Isthmus, um, but me and my editors, like we really just noticed that he was making some positive change. And so when I found out that he was leaving, I was shocked because when I had interviewed him a couple years before that, he said he would never, like East was his dream job and he wanted to retire there. And so I, when I saw that, I was like, okay, I need to sit down with you and find out more about it. And um, he essentially had just decided that he thought he could make more of an impact with all of the high schools by being the superintendent of high schools. And it was a really hard decision for him. But that being said, to get to like the basis of your question, I think having been in the city and on the east side and seeing that transition over time made it a really easy fit to slide into that project and that reporting. But again, I wouldn't discourage anyone from going somewhere and just really putting the time in to build that trust. And then you start to get those little stories or those little inklings of things that you might not get otherwise. My name is Christy Zen and I'm a junior at McFarland High School. This question is for Amanda. 
At Simpson Street Free Press, we have followed and written about PFAS contamination in local waterways and wells. After the explosion and fires downtown, uh, in downtown Madison this summer, PFAS chemicals were found in Lake Monona, Starkweather Creek, and several Madison wells. As a result, the city of Madison announced this week it was switching to firefighting foam that is PFAS free. You and Danica Lewis co covered this story for Wisconsin TV News 3 Now. Can you tell us how a news organiz organization like Channel 3 follows a story like this? Because there's a lot of information out there about PFAS, and it must be difficult to cover everything and really keep the public informed. Yeah, thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, we, we don't know everything. I don't know everything about PFAS. It, honestly, I, I don't know very much about PFAS because coming here, I had never heard of it before I came here. And be really before the explosion, we didn't really know what it was. It wasn't a big topic of conversation. So I think that we really have to hear from the community to know, to know what's important sometimes. So, you know, scientists, and people who study water here, they made it known that this was really important. Um, and so that kind of, you know, makes a bell go off in our heads. This is obviously really important. Um, I think that with the firefighting foam, that was something that the Madison Fire Department wanted to put out there um, because they were really proud of it. And I think once people were figuring out what PFAS is and, you know, like me, didn't know very much about it and had to quickly learn how is this affecting our water? What is this linked to? This is linked to cancer. That really opens people's eyes. Uh, so the fire department reached out to us in terms of the, the firefighting foam piece of the story uh, to really show that they care too. Um, and that was really interesting to I guess to hear, once a lot of people make a lot of noise about an issue, you never really know, okay, is this is this going to make change? Or is something going to change? Because it's a big deal to change their firefighting foam. It was more money. They had to throw out all the foam that they had before. So it was a big change, but it was great to see, you know, kind of a, I guess not an end to the story, but something to kind of wrap up the story that firefighters care too they are willing to make changes and they are also they also realize that it's an issue it's something that they're they're not ignoring so like maybe a lot of people i didn't know what pfas was but i think once you hear how important it is you just have to jump feet first into it and do your own research and really figure out how dangerous it really is this question is for all four panelists Recent news stories brought to light a new policy at my high school, Madison West, called grading floors. In required courses like English, math, and science, a grade floor means no assignment can receive less than 40%, regardless of whether it is completed. This story broke because an anonymous teacher at West High School leaked a letter from the school principal. Several students followed up and asked teachers about the policy and most teachers didn't seem to like the policy. But when contacted by journalists, no teachers were willing to speak on the record. Can you talk about what a reporter can do to dig deeper into a story when the people involved don't want to make their views public? I, I can add some and maybe we can just kind of go back and forth. <coughs> so I think with TV, this makes it even more difficult because not only are you asking them information you're asking them to put their face on tv and their name on tv and say it with the camera there and that is obviously scary for a lot of people so um you really it's really about building relationships with people in the community that's kind of the best you can do in situations like that because if you've talked to them before if they know you if you know you met them at an event like this they might be more willing to talk to you, but I think it, it definitely makes it more difficult when you show up with a camera. <laughs> if anyone else wants to add, we can add some. Um, I, I might think of more things later, um, but I, 
I guess I don't know if this would work very well for the school districts, but either for any kind of government organization, when you run into that issue, you can do records requests. If you know that there's an issue that needs to be exposed more, you can re records re request their emails and go through them. Or if you know there's a certain document, you can look for that. Um, I think a lot of times if people aren't willing to speak on the record, you can sort of start talking with them with an off the record conversation and just have a conversation. And I think a lot of times when, not all the time, but at least sometimes when you have a conversation with someone, if they aren't initially willing to go on the record, if they know you a little more and are more comfortable with you, they might be willing to. Um, or if it's really a story you can't get any other way, you could have them in the story anonymously. Um, but I think documents are probably the most promising way to go. I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add there. Any ideas? I think that's something that we don't know the answer to a lot of times. It's like, and you mentioned the you mentioned the an email from the principal, I think, is kind of how it got out. In terms of documents, that would be very helpful to us. So like maybe we wouldn't need to talk to a teacher about it. If we had this letter from the principal to the teachers talking about it, that would be, I mean, in my sense, that that is kind of proof that this Um, also, I would say, like, you know, building relationships is going to be super important and um, being able to even have an article like this out is going to be important to build trust with even parents. You know, once a parent hears about this and maybe it's, you know, really dedicated parents that's like all in their kids business and like knows, you know, what their <laughs> grades are and what they should be, uh, or maybe they were educators themselves and um, can kind of understand some things that are deeper um, than other parents might understand. So. Um, I don't know, it is really difficult, I'm sure, uh, but uh, parents are another way to go. Um, but again, it would have to be someone that maybe read the story and understands it and then um, would want to say something about it. Um, I would say that this is very sad to hear that this is happening, especially in Madison. Um, you know, the cancer of low expectations has been haunting this district for a long time, but really seeing this uh, take place in a way like Great Fork is really, uh, it really blows my mind, I think. So. Just one thing I would add really quick, agreeing with everything that's been said so far, is some. a lot of times teachers are really worried to talk to the press. They're worried about what their principals might say. They have to oftentimes get an okay from the district spokesperson or the communications department to even talk to a reporter. And so operating within that system can be kind of difficult. I think for teachers especially who kind of fear retribution a lot of the time and so another avenue is reaching out to the teachers union is something that can be helpful they don't always have a statement but uh, a lot of times they'll at least kind of speak on behalf of teachers and give that slight element of protection and maybe that then opens the avenue for someone to say well this is worth it I'm ready to share or maybe talk to you at least kind of on background, giving you some information that might be helpful to ask the right questions of the district or of whoever you're talking to. This question is also for all of the panelists. The Capital Times Isthmus, Wisconsin State Journal, met many other media outlets and the Wisconsin Freedom of Information Council have reported extensively in recent months about the issues of open records laws and open meetings rules here in Wisconsin. Some public officials, however, seem to resist or stall when it comes to open records requests. Simpson Street Free Press students are very interested in this topic, and we recently interviewed Tom Kamenick of the Wisconsin Transparency Project. As professional journalists, can you comment on the importance of open records laws and the principle of the public's right to know. <laughs> or we're all going to look at each other. Um, that is difficult, 
And um, I think a lot of times I feel as a journalist, like, especially, you know, the, the question you just asked, our hands are tied sometimes and you, you just have to do everything you can. And I think you kind of have to know your rights in those situations. I've been in a situation where it was an open meeting. I went with the camera and I was not allowed in. And you kind of have to think that's not right. That doesn't make sense. So, you know, I had to call my boss and they said, that's not right. You know, we have a lawyer. And they said, that's not right. You should be able to go into this meeting. So I think you have to know when to stand up for yourself in those situations. And it's hard. It's scary sometimes when people are not allowing you in a room, but you know that you deserve to be in there. So I think part of it is understanding, understanding when you deserve to be in a room like that. Um, in terms of open records requests, um, it's hard to know how long it will take. And I think that that is one of the issues, <coughs> especially, you know, we have a show at five o'clock. So oftentimes if I reach out to someone in the morning, they're going to say, sure, we could get it to you in four days. And that is very difficult because you, the story is going on. The story is going to happen at five o'clock. So you kind of have to talk to people and let them know your deadlines. Oftentimes that kind of helps. Um, maybe they won't be able to give me the whole record, but maybe they can answer a few questions about it for me. Um, so kind of realizing that oftentimes those open records requests are not going to be as fast as you need them to be, um, but trying to work with someone. And again, that goes back to having a good relationship with someone that you can kind of plead your case and tell them, hey, I need some help here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, if you ask anyone in this profession, the importance of being able to access information and as long as it isn't going to harm somebody, it's paramount. The, you know, our job is to bring information and truth to people so they can better make choices and know what's going on in their community. And any kind of impediment on that is, is really problematic. Um, I think that things that you can do other than, you know, things that you just said, um, is just make sure that you're also covering all of your bases. Like, is there another avenue for you to get that information? Is it a letter from a principal that maybe you don't have to do a FOIA for or something? Or when you're at a meeting, you know, taking really good notes or maybe recording it so that if anyone's like, I didn't say that, or they're trying to come back to you to say something is wrong, you can say, well, no, you did. And this was open and this was allowed. Just kind of to give yourself that level of protection is, is always a good idea. Um, but I like personally haven't ever had to file like a huge records request. Um, most of my time has just been dealing with you know, the school district and trying to say, well, I really need this information by this date and kind of having to really push for that. And that's just kind of being as annoying as possible. And eventually, hopefully they will respond. <laughs> um, I, I also haven't dealt all that much with tons of different records requests. That's something that I, I want to do more and um, sort of dig around more. I just am kind of starting working on that. Um, I, I did, when I worked for the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, I did run into um, some issues. I did a story about uh, concussions and how they are impacting the uh, Badger football team. And I talked with some former Badgers who are experiencing post-concussion symptoms. And the center did this big records request and uh, just tons of all the important information that we wanted was basically redacted. We wanted to know how many concussions were happening in each sport and kind of understand the prevalence of them at the school and they would just they they only gave us a total number of concussions that happened over like a five year span and it was really not super helpful um 
in to kind of go around that we I I fought with them back and forth via email a lot and over the phone and it wasn't very successful um, I think that the center is still going to try to push back to get those eventually um, with maybe some help of some legal advice on that um, but we had to run my story without that uh, I think to get more information I searched through social media in order to find because they they have these injury reports that are public where they list these out and they a lot of people tweet them out so i did an advanced twitter search for the reporters who were tweeting out these injury reports because they are public they just aren't they didn't we requested the injury reports but some of them were missing and so i was finding some more over the spring season that were missed um so that was one avenue that i took when they weren't as open as we thought they should be. Um, but overall, I just think that the open records law is so incredibly important to journalism and reporting and understanding what things are, ha what what's happening that people need to know about. I think there are so many amazing stories that couldn't be told if it weren't for the open records law. I think uh, my colleague Kelly uh, Meyerhofer, her story about the toxic lab at UW-Madison where um, this professor was, he had this horrible toxic environment where he was kind of berating students and then one of those students ended up committing suicide. That story would have never been told if it hadn't been for a records request that she made. So I just, I think that it's really important and it's important to push back when we aren't getting the open records that we need. Yeah, I definitely agree with um, all the other panelists, um, definitely Emily, uh, when it comes to the importance of open records, it's super important um, for open records, uh, for the open records law, and also just in general for the public's right to know what's going on in their communities. And I think um, I have been a little bit disappointed in how, you know, as a journalist, you realize how sometimes public officials don't understand the importance of open record laws or don't respect it the way that they should um, when it comes to, oh, you have to ask a million times for the open record. You have to wait months, possibly. Um, we've even seen this, um, when I say we, this is the Street Free Press and a lot of other people that we've talked to have seen this with even the school district and, and they've kind of developed a reputation for uh, you know, not providing open records in the timely fashion that they should or responding to them even uh, when they should. And so, um, yeah, it's super important. Uh, like Emily said, uh, there's a lot of stories that wouldn't be uh, stories or wouldn't be broken without open records, so. And I think just to add, even with the secrecy, secrecy that like happens, um, even with your story, Emily, um, not to keep calling you on, <laughs> uh, but with the um, cameras being hidden in the hotels and how uh, the school district or officials have to keep things so close to their vests and when some things should just be open and, you know, parents and uh, especially con very concerned parents who would want to know what's going on and what really happened, um, I think it's important for certain things to just you know, come out and just be out in the open is better than hiding them, so. Thank you all. Um, and you've all shared some of your success. Oh, sorry, I'm Janet Nardine, journalism student at UW. Um, you've all shared some of your successes as women in journalism, um, but I'm eager to know, what are some bumps in the road that you've had to overcome? How did you handle them? And what suggestions can you give to people going into journalism? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, I would say, and I'm gonna be very honest, and I wanna, um, uh, no offense to Amanda, by the way, <laughs> uh, you'll see why. <laughs> um, I did, so one of the challenges for me is I um, was told that I probably would be pretty good at broadcast. I always thought that it was really cool to be an anchor. I thought it would be cool to you know, be on TV and all that. And 
you know, people were hyping me up about it. So I did an internship um, with Channel 27 and not three thousand so <laughs> and it was it honestly was a great internship but I also realized that that actually is not what I want to do um, so despite I, I'm good at speaking or despite whatever people were telling me or whatever I felt uh, I think the internship showed me that uh, broadcast journalism is not something that I want to do uh, so I think that was the biggest challenge to kind of realize you know it's important to realize what you do want to do but it's also important to realize what you don't want to do um, so while it was an interesting kind of experiment um, for myself, but um, it showed me a lot. Uh, yeah. It, were you just talking about challenges? Sorry. Um, challenges <laughs> and how you really still maintain them. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So um, that would be a challenge just to realize like you're not gonna always do exactly what you thought you were gonna do, and that's okay. Um, you can always pivot and life and I will never do anything else like you know I I'm a failure no I think that it's important to pivot and realize that that taught you in a lesson and that uh, it just showed you a different view of what success can look like for you um, and so also that was not mentioned yet uh, I don't think is that I also I work at CUNA Mutual Group and um, even in the School of Journalism I study strategic communications like marketing PR um, and I focus more on that than the reporting side. And so I found an avenue that I really love when it comes to corporate communications or strategic communications um, in a business setting. And so, uh, yeah, so even though I had challenges, uh, it really opened my eyes to what all the possibilities are for me. So. Um, I think one of the sort of bumps in the road that I experienced was when I first started at the um, Center for Investigative Journalism. I had only been there for a month or so, so I was pretty, I reported at the Badger Herald a bunch, um, but I kind of, it had been a bit since I was doing like reporting because I took a, a, a little bit of a break from that. Um, so I was at the center about a month in. I was working on this story about cash bail and how it can impact low-income defendants. Um, basically, if you are arrested for a crime and you can't afford your bail, you get stuck in jail even if you're even when you're supposed to be presumed innocent. I had been working on that story, just that story, for about a month already, and I was talking to a judge and I was asking her. We had already done an interview with her, but I was asking her some more questions about some more details that I was confused about because I was confused by this past reporter's notes. Um, and she basically told me that if I was asking these questions, I clearly didn't understand this issue. My story was going, was not going to be good and that I might as well just start over and that it, I just, wasn't going to do a good job and that I wasn't a good reporter in an interview with her and it was really just so stressful and um like the worst interview I've ever had I was really upset um but I did a great job with that story um it turned out it was picked up by the uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and the Cap Times and the Star Tribune um and it I think it really kind of shed a light on a very important issue. So I guess my part of one advice or token of advice I guess I would have is when people tell you that, know that that's not true and know your worth and don't let that get you down, I guess. Um, another thing that was a hurdle for me was um, I was really scared that I wasn't going to be able to write fast enough when I started. Um, but now I'm actually a little more comfortable writing daily stories because it's the deadline pressure. You just you get it done in one day and then it's done and it's a big relief. And I'm really confident doing that now. So I think that I guess just don't doubt yourself and... I think if you keep working at it, you'll 
be able to figure it out <laughs> even when people say you can't. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I think kind of jumping off of what Emily was saying, um, there have just been like tons of times as a young woman reporter or I've walked into an interview with an official and we'd maybe only spoken over email or the phone and you walk in and they're just like immediately think that you're like they don't take you seriously that you're too young or are you old enough to be here and things like that just kind of annoying comments and you know it can be jarring at first and it can totally make you question like I can't should I be here <laughs> am I too young like and you know just like really trust yourself you've done the work and you've done the research and you know what you're doing is really important and so even if someone is kind of judging that or trying to bring you down or just is basing their presumptions off of what you might look like or whatnot you know, don't pay attention to them <laughs> um, and then also just the other thing is you know when I was younger and in high school and college, like my measure of success was, you know, oh, I need to go work for the New York Times or I need to you know, write for the Atlantic. And those are still awesome dreams and like would love to do it. But, you know, you can like, I've seen a lot of things lately about how important local news is and how that is just as good of a dream job as working for a national entity. And you're still doing as equal of an important service. And so just, measuring success by making sure you're feeling like you're contributing and that you're getting fulfillment out of that is just as important as you know the big wig names and you're just as good and just as important of a piece of the puzzle um so i think similarly to both of you um i guess when i when i started this career in journalism the fake news idea was not really out there when I started. So when once people started to doubt, now there's this idea that if somebody doesn't like a story, they're gonna say it's not true. And that has become really difficult for me, especially social media. People can comment and say, fake news, this isn't right. You have to just be confident and know that you did all of the research and that it's it is true just because somebody doesn't like your story or doesn't agree with it doesn't mean that you didn't do a great job and put all the right information out there i think comments um i should not read comments and i do and it is hard <laughs> it's really really hard because you put so much into your story i feel like i work really hard every day and there's a comment and you are it, it it is hard to not let it get you down but you just have to know that you did you did the work all the information is correct you know you have to just be confident in yourself and the work that you did and you just shouldn't read them i know i it sounds bad you in one sense it's like you want to know how people reacted to your story but in the other sense if if they're just gonna call names and say mean things, don't pay attention to it. So I think that is, there's just a, a harsher criticism on journalists right now. And that is something that you should consider going into this career. It, it's hard um, when you're out there by yourself with the camera, sometimes it's a little scary. You are going up to houses where you don't know how they're going to react to you. You don't know if they hate journalists, if they think we're all fake news. So I think it's just a different idea um, that I don't want to say you need to get used to, but you need to be prepared for people to be harsh and be critics and just know that you're doing a great job. If you are going out there and putting your hard work into it, then their opinion shouldn't matter. For our last question, I'd like to ask each of our panelists uh, if they have any advice that they could offer for the young people here tonight who are interested in pursuing a career in journalism. Uh, like what should we study? What coursework and what majors are the best for us to pursue? And more generally, 
how should we prepare for the field of journalism? <laughs> um, education is very important, and that that is, that is v great. On the other hand, if you don't take a class that you think was really important, the best way to learn it is to go out there. I did not take broadcast classes because they were all full. I didn't take, you know, some of the classes that I really wanted to take, and I'm still here. You know, I, I think you can learn a lot in the classroom, but the best way to do it is to follow someone, is to watch their stories, read their stories, kind of get a feel of what their everyday life is. You can, you can learn a lot in a journalism class, but at the end of the day, you're gonna be out there on your own and you're not gonna be you know, looking back at your textbooks every day to try to figure out what to do next. So my advice is to do internships. Internships were very, very helpful for me. And um, even if you know, one of the internships I did, I was getting copies of things and I was bringing them coffee and that was not what I wanted to do at all, but I just found my in. I found someone that I really liked their storytelling. And so I was like, hey, on a day that I'm not at this internship, can I just come meet you somewhere and see how you do it? And she let me. So I just followed her around and she was the morning reporter. So at 4 a.m. I was there and I was just following her, seeing how she worked with the camera, seeing how the photographer worked, um, seeing what their day to day was like was the best that I could learn to get to this spot. And there are, there are a lot of internships. I know, I know you talked about an internship you did. There are a lot of internships um, that are helpful, but I think you have to go the extra mile. You have to ask questions. You have to say to a reporter, hey, can you show me how to do this? And we're more than willing to show you because we've been in that situation. So I think it's really getting your foot in the door with somebody who's, who can just show you how to do these things, not, not there's not a class that's, hey, how to be a reporter 101 and you're gonna learn everything. So you just have to do it on your own. Nobody, nobody helped me make a reel. Nobody helped me do those things. I just kind of did it and you know, asked for people's advice. Hey, does this look good? Does this look bad? You just have to go with it on your own. And if you really have, if you really have it in you that you wanna do that, then you can totally do it. Yeah, so, I mean, I think one of the biggest things I would recommend is if you do go to college and you're pursuing a degree, whether it's journalism or not, uh, getting involved with the school newspaper is a really good way to get your feet wet and try to write about different things. There's the ability, like, obviously school newspapers are still, like, really good entities doing really good work, but it gives you a chance to try things. And if you make a mistake, like you're gonna figure it out and it's gonna be okay. And it's a really good way to meet people as well that might end up being in the field later that you could reach out to. So like I worked for the Daily Cardinal in college and it was such a good experience and I would like encourage everyone to do that. Um, the other thing is like actually talking to your teachers, like go to discussion hours or like office hours. I wish I would have done that more. You know, I have one teacher that I stay in touch with that kind of became a mentor and her advice has been so important to me throughout my career. Um, and then, you know, always be like reading good writing or watching good news. I mean, sometimes the easiest way to learn is watching the pros do it and kind of seeing what styles you like, what do you like to read and kind of trying to figure out what you would like to do. And finally, and like, I think this is so important is whoever you're working with, like get a good editor <laughs> because every writer and reporter, like it's so nice to have someone that you can bounce ideas off of and that you can know and trust cares as much about the end product. And that sometimes takes away some of the nervousness of like, did I get everything right? And so like behind every good writer is, a, is an equally good editor. So would like to second the student newspaper or I guess 
third, maybe. Um, I wrote for the Badger Herald, not to be yeah, like Cardinal. Okay. We have a rivalry. <laughs> um, but I think that is where I learned the vast majority of what it kind of laid the whole foundation for me of journalism and reporting. I, granted, I, I started at the Badger Herald before I got into the journalism school at UW-Madison. So when I got there, I was like, well, I know this already because I've been working at the Badger Herald. So I think the journalism school is was still really valuable. And there were some classes that were really amazing. I, I took a, um, a creative nonfiction class that was really great. Um, I think it I still sort of think back on that class when I'm doing interviews and trying to sort of get little details from people that you might not expect to be useful in your writing, but can really make a story sort of flourish, I guess. Um, and I think uh, Taylor and I did Curb Magazine together too, which was really incredible because you actually like make a magazine and that was an awesome experience as well any classes where you are actually doing things because journalism is very much a learn by doing field i don't think you could ever learn it just sitting in a classroom like i don't really think my history of mass communication class has been super useful <laughs> um, i i think yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that but i also would uh, so skills classes, working for your newspaper or the student newspapers, um, and then just in terms of when you get to the point of applying for jobs, don't procrastinate on your resume. And um, I think your cover letter is kind of the most important thing in journalism jobs. And so make sure that you have a lot of people you really trust, maybe your professors, if you know your professor because you went to office hours, <laughs> um, have them read through that and make sure everything is just really spotless, I think, for more practical mm -hmm. things. Yeah, you all have given a really, really great advice. So like, just to add um, to that, I think, listen to them <laughs> for sure um, and then um, continue with Simpson Street Free Press of course um, <laughs> you're gonna get really great skills and you know get better and better at your writing through Simpson Street Free Press and never handing in your first draft of course um, and even participating in the uh, internships that we provide so I know uh, we do have students who go to Channel 3, Isthmus, um, we've had students go to Wisconsin State Journal or the Cap Times so um, continue with Simpson Street Free Press um, and even though you have other obligations of course um, it's going to be important at, at a young age to keep working on your writing um, and then when you get to the higher level or college level definitely listen to everything that they said um, but even while you are thinking about a journalist um, kind of mindset think about how to listen well and ask good questions so even practicing this with your friends and your family um, practicing actually listening to them and not waiting for your turn to speak but listening to them and then think of okay what is going to be my follow-up question for them they won't know that you're interviewing them <laughs> but interview them you know um in a way and they're going to be like oh she's a really great listener he's a really great listener great person i love to talk to them uh but at the same time you're kind of working on your journalist you know journalism skills so i think that's just been big for me is um, learning to listen and ask good questions, whether I'm actually writing a story or not, uh, is important. So. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone who came for joining us here tonight. And thank you to our wonderful panelists, Amanda Quintana, Jenny Peak, Emily Hamer, and Taylor Kilgore. I'd also like to thank the AV Foundation, Wisconsin State Journal, and the Capital Times for supporting youth journalism here in Wisconsin. And please connect with us, Simpson Street Free Press, on Facebook and Twitter. And remember, never ever hand in your first draft. Thank you. Thank you.